All right, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Everyone's at the right meeting. We're talking about ingrown toenails. Yes, no, maybe so. All right. So uh, do you guys see Molly at the side there? She said that every time I make her laugh, I get a bonus point. So we're going to work on that today. We're talking about bladder conditions. Now, um, before anybody ever gives you a lecture, there are the W's of a lecture. Has anyone heard about that before? No? You've never heard of the W of a lecture? Who am I, why am I here, and why should you care? Okay. That's a good one. But, um, but I also know I'm competing with a long day, and I'm competing with uh, lunch, and lunch sometimes is markedly more interesting than the speaker. So if we're going to talk about that, and we're talking about bladder issues, right, urine, bladder, stuff like that, we should start with my favorite urology joke. Everybody want to hear that? Molly, this is just so you laugh. All right, if you don't laugh at this joke, I'm, I'm totally in bad shape here. So I was in the office yesterday, and um, I was a little behind, typical day, a little behind, and there's a, uh, a 60-year-old, a 70-year-old, and an 80-year-old sitting at, in the office, and I'm behind, and they're looking at their watch. Why is this guy behind? And this, they start talking, and they turn to the 60-year-old, and they, says, why are you? So they ask him, why are you here? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm having a problem peeing. I, I get up at 7 in the morning, and I go to the bathroom, and I, I push, and I push, and I push, and a little drop comes out, but I can't live like this. All right? We, we, we know that kind of patient. And they turn to the 70-year-old, and they said, why are you here? And the 70-year-old says, my problem's my bowels. I, I get up at 7.30 in the morning, and I push, and I push, and I push, and I, I get a little bit out, but I just can't live like that. He turned to the 80-year-old and they said, why are you here? He goes, well, 7 o'clock in the morning, my bladder empties completely. 7.30 in the morning, my bowels empty completely. They said, well, why are you here? He goes, well, I don't wake up till 8. <laughs> Do I get a point for that? I'm going to keep a scorecard. All right, we'll hold a, the Molly scorecard here. There you go. All right, so if I'm talking about, this is, we're going to get into the W's of the lecture. And as you can see, I am not going to stand behind a podium. I am allergic to them. Um, so if I'm talking about bladder control, what kind of doctor does that make me? Say, what I can hear you. Who says what? Urologist? How many say urologist? How many say something else? How many say podiatrist? Are we going back to the ingrown toenail bit? All right. So what do you think I am? What kind of doc? What, what kind, if I'm not a urologist, what am I? A what? A physiatrist. I can't even pronounce that. I didn't do a physiatry residency. So, uh, psychiatrist. You know, I'm a family doctor. Isn't that surprising? How many are surprised that a family doctor is talking about bladder control issues? All right. Well, here's another surprising thing. I've been a uh, patient-centered medical home for 10 years. Maybe 12. I can't even count. I lost track. You know, when it first... Be I'm in Michigan, and when it first became available, I jumped on it. Okay, I am the lead doc, the founder of a group of six or seven of us now. We um, see a lot of patients. We've been a PCMH. I'm part of a SIN. I'm just switching my SIN to a different group. The other group thought I am sinful for doing that, but I did it anyhow. That's a SIN joke. Everyone know what a SIN is? SIN, clinically integrated network, ACO, accountable care organization. I-D-U-Y-A, I do not understand your abbreviations, stuff like that. And these are hard. I mean, I'll tell you, I thought being part of a PCMH was difficult, and it is. It is very difficult, but being part of the SIN and the ACO is even worse. It's kind of like the PCMH on steroids with rules that are a moving target, and we don't understand those. So um, before I go, that's kind of the who am I, but so... Let me change for just a second here. How many are, um, so you guys, we're all here because this is a patient's a PCMH meeting. So the who am I, I've already addressed that. Now, I lied to you once. I promise it's the only time I'm going to lie to you. I'm actually a urologist in my first life. So I was uh, in my uh, chief year of urology at Harvard at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I realized that I would rather slice my throat than spend another day as a urologist. So I shifted gears, and I went into what I really loved about medicine, which was primary care. And it was interesting, when I shifted to primary care, I realized how much urology is getting missed. 
You know, like when we talk about OAB, it's not like you wake up in the morning and say, oh, my bladder is a problem. I'm going to go talk to a urologist because you don't know what a urologist is. And if you do know what a urologist is, you know they put things in parts of your body that things shouldn't go into. Right? And you're like cringing. Ow. I don't want to do that. So um, what was interesting is 20, 25 years ago, I start, I do research. Um, I kind of, when I went to Harvard, I thought I was going to be an academic. I moved to Michigan. I thought I wasn't. And then I kind of got back into it. It's like, it's like uh, uh, the godfather. Just when, I, just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. And that kind of happened to me. And I started writing up this stuff. And, and lo and behold, now 20 years later, I've published about 90 articles. I do book chapters. I'm an editor for a major journal. And what I teach is primary care, how to deal with urologic issues. That's what I do. That's my life. And, I mean, most of my life is seeing patients, but that's, this is what I do on the side. So when we tie this into the whole patient-centered medical home and OAB, what does it actually mean? It means we have these patients with a problem that we're going to define and all of these folks that don't get care. So that's where the PCMH comes in. The patient-centered medical home idea for us is what can we do to pull patients in and help them and help them in a way of maybe diagnosing something they, didn't, they, they had, but they didn't know they can get help for, make their life a little better, make medicine more efficient, quality of life goes up. That's the whole purpose of a PCMH. And as I've taught my staff for years, and this is well before we were a no, uh, PCMH, I need them to be involved. My staff have to be involved. My, my front desk clerks, my, uh, my, my support staff, my MAs and my nurses, my NP, my PA, the other docs, we all have to be integrated into this, certainly for PCMH work, but for mainly for, in this case, for OAB, to try to identify those patients. And what's interesting is my staff identify more of my OAB patients than I do. Because they'll come out of a room and say, you know, this person's having a problem. When they were undressing, I saw their diaper. By the way, while they were waiting for you because you're always behind, they went to the bathroom three times. Maybe you should talk to them about that. Okay? So understanding this disease, and we have a lot of slides here, but understanding the disease of, of, uh, of urinary incontinence and overactive bladder is an, uh, it's a village concept. I'm going to go back to that. And that's so the who am I, why am I here, and why should you care? I just integrated all that in because this, this helps us. And if the goal of a PCMH is to make our patients' lives better, then this is an integral part of that. So let's, let's play a little bit. These are our objectives. We're going to recognize symptomology, pathophysiologic conditions. That's kind of a big, big word. That's like the physiatry word you just threw out. We're going to talk about the clinical trials and the pharmacologic treatment, talk about evidence-based guidelines, and then talk about how to integrate this. Let's start with word soup. Everyone understand the term of word soup? We have a lot of ways to describe this issue. And this is something I've been working with year, for years. Everybody, everybody who has a new medication, for example, wants to come up with a new term to describe what we know is an old disease. You know, in fact, overactive bladder. Who's heard overactive bladder before? All right. Who knows that that was a pharma-created term? That was for, Pfizer created that years ago with tolterity. They wanted a way to describe these symptoms. And it's actually useful, but you need to understand what, where, where terms come from. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about a couple of the definitions. This is from the ICS, the International, Incontin or International Continent Society. UI, complaint of involuntary leakage. Oops. I'm voiding. Oops, I didn't mean to. It came out. SUI, complaint of involuntary leakage upon exertion. Okay, and these are important to know, but we're going to tie them in later. But stress incontinence like this. I'm jumping. I play tennis. I leak a little bit. Okay, that's an anatomic issue. Urinary, urge urinary incontinence. I have this urge, and I've got to go as I'm rushing to the bathroom. Urge urinary incontinence. Mixed UI is obviously a mixture of all of those. Nocturia, nocturia comes nocturnal, nighttime, nighttime voiding, usually frequent nighttime voiding. Increased daytime frequency, that's pretty self-explanatory. I go a lot during the day. I'm going to go around the horn here. Overactive bladder, OAB, urgent, urinary urgency, usually accompanied with frequency in nocturia with or without incontinence. 
And finally, urgency. The reason I did this last is urgency is the major symptom. This is what brings people to the office. I've got to go. I don't have enough time to get there. That's what urgency is. Okay? I, it's just, I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to go now. Okay? In fact, there's another term we don't have up here called warning time. Has everyone ever heard warning time? Warning time is the period between I got to go to get to the bathroom before you're going to wet yourself. And that's another description that patients will use. So the reality is if we talk about overactive bladder, and that's what I consider, I consider overactive bladder and urgency to be pretty much the same thing. A lot of people have it. Less than 50% will discuss it. That was an ARS question, so everyone's going to get that right. There's your hint. It was 50%. The reality is, of the people who have it, very few will be diagnosed and offer treatment, and even fewer will stay on therapy. Now, it's common. We think about OAB being a female disease. Women go to the bathroom a lot, okay? That's kind of this urban myth. I mean, the reality is we all go to the bathroom a lot. Women are actually better at their own health care than men. We all know that. So they're going to identify those things. But it happens more commonly in women. But as they get older, it's equal in men and women. So the point with here is if you have a patient who is frustrated with his treatment, for example, he he comes in, I have a prostate issue. Well, I saw this doctor, I have a prostate issue, nothing helps. Well, the question is, are you having a prostate issue or is it actually your bladder? It's common. I was in the office yesterday, a very, very busy day. I saw bronchitis, a lot of diabetics, a lot of asthmatics, a lot of heart disease. I guarantee you there was more overactive bladder in that office. Whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed, people have that. And where are they? If, they're, if it's so common, where is it? Well, this is one thing. I'll guarantee you there are those in this audience that have symptoms. I'll guarantee you, you have family members who have these symptoms. I will guarantee you that there are people at this meeting who have spare clothes in their briefcase, spare spare underwear, spare pants. They may have uh, pads. They may have diapers in their bag because, God forbid, there's an emergency. I guarantee you there are people who came here if they got on a plane. They didn't drink for two hours before because they didn't want to have to pee. I guarantee you there are people who know where every bathroom is in this building because they don't want to rush to it. I guarantee you there are people who know every clean bathroom between Orlando and Miami because nobody wants to stop at the stinky rest stop. All right? And you time your life accordingly. Okay? And we talk about this OAB. Because of this, it negatively impacts our life. I mean, physically, you know... A lot of limitations. I'm not going to sleep well. Sex. uh, I don't want to have sex if I'm worried about going to the bathroom. That's kind of a turnoff. All right? So we practice avoidance behavior. Uh, Domestic, we've already talked about specialized uh, pads and, and, and diapers and specialized clothing. Psychological, you know, you take the biggest, brawniest guy in the world and you make him wet himself, or you not make him wet himself, but if he wets himself, you think he's got a good self esteem? Heck no. And he doesn't want to talk to you about it. And he's worried that you're going to smell it. Right? We're terrified of that because, unfortunately, urine doesn't always smell that good. Uh, social, I'm not going to sit there and go play bridge with my friends or go to a movie if I have to go to the bathroom all the time. And finally, occupational. This is big. And as a PCMH, we need to be aware of this. Because, uh, well, if patient, we, we talk about absenteeism and presentism. Does everyone hear those terms? I I am sick all the time. I don't go to work. That's absenteeism. I do go to work, but I'm I'm hindered by my issues, my health issues, my overactive bladder. That's presentism. If I have to go to the bathroom every hour, right, I can't do my job. People are going to notice. I had a, a patient recently. It was interesting. She had a problem. I knew she had a problem, but she was tolerating it, and she worked right next to the bathroom in the factory. So she can slip off the assembly line and use the bathroom and come back, and not a lot of people noticed. They moved factories. Her position is on the other side of the building now. Now she has to walk by everybody and back. Now it's a problem. It was a problem before. Now it's become a real serious issue. Well, it's expensive. You know, this slide, which is very busy, I want to bring this up. When we talk about diagnosis, 1% treatment, 31, so 32% there. The health-related consequences and lost productivity is over 50%. 
So forget about the, the, the cost of the health care portion of it. What it does to you in society is even more expensive. And interestingly enough, pads are the biggest driver of health care cost. The number one driver for costs are pads, and patients have to pay for that out of pocket. That's another issue. Wait a minute, I'm on a fixed budget. I don't have a lot of money, and pads are... Anyone priced pads out recently? You know, if you go to the store, it's expensive. And, you, you know, you guys are in the retirement mecca of the world. I guarantee you, any supermarket here that you go to will have rows of diapers. It'll be a gauntlet surrounding you. It's a little scary. I have long pushed that uh, diaper makers, just like we have warnings on cigarettes, we should have warnings on diapers to say, have you actually talked to your doctor? All right, because we might be able to help with that. Okay. Physicians and patients' perception differ. This is from an article I wrote with uh, uh, Roger Domokoski years ago. You know, the, physician, the patient has to raise the issue most of the time. Only few get treatment and few discuss it. Again, that's going back to that ARS question. It's kind of a paper I wrote with a buddy of mine, Scott McDermott, where we realized that patient doctors are saying, I don't have time for this. It's not my, not my issue. I'm not a specialist. If it was an issue, the patient would bring it up. And, you know, your genitals aren't going to kill you. Your heart will, so let me focus. That's a primary care issue. And I will say, maybe not. Maybe not. Because if you're, you have OAB, if you have urinary issues and you're going to the bathroom a lot at night or frequently during the day where you're rushing, because you got to go, you got to go, all right? When do older folks trip and fall? At night. What were you doing up at 3 in the morning that you fell? I was going to the bathroom. I slipped on the dog, all right? Or I slipped in my urine on the way back. And if you give me an older patient who slips and falls, what's the mortality? It's bad. When I get that phone call from the hospital, this 70-year-old, you know, Jane Doe fell and broke her hip, I'm thinking 50% mortality in the first year. If it's her husband, 80% mortality. And this kind of backs that up. In overactive bladder, falls and fractures are common. You, if you fall, you can get a break. If you break, you're going to die. It's a bad way to go. I just had a patient uh, die, a 90-year-old this week, who fell, broke her hip, and that was the end of it. I had another one who, uh, who fell, broke, had a sacral fracture, right? Non-displaced. It's actually really a bad case. She had a lot of pain. She couldn't live with the pain. She talked the surgeon into operating to pin it, which I, I am blown away that she did that. This would have passed, right? Uh, she died uh, from a PE, you know? And had we stopped her from the fall, you know? So we give osteoporosis medication so that when you fall, you bounce, you don't break, Maybe we need to find out why you're falling and check on that. The PCPs, this, this again comes from some of my work. The primary doc should know this starts in her office. There's a lot of medically related LUTs. I mean, we all have different voiding issues, voiding symptoms, but if we start drinking a lot of water because Dr. Oz said it was a good idea or we had a heart attack and we have a, take a diuretic now, and that's a medically induced exacerbation of your lower urinary tract symptoms. That's not the urologist forte. That's not necessarily OAB. That's, we gave you stuff that's going to make you do that. The reality of it is the diagnosis doesn't require an extensive or complicated evaluation, and there's really a lot of good stuff we can do in a primary care setting. And one of the things I will tell my colleagues is there's good stuff that we can do in a primary care setting in five minutes or less with duct tape and popsicle sticks. All right, we can work this up. One day visit, here's your therapy, let's give it a shot. That's what we need to do. So if we're going to do this, and this is important for us now, you know, the, for the doctors, we've all learned this over time, so it's a review, but for everybody else who may not be directly in patient care, to understand OAB, we have to understand the symptoms. For patients to understand the symptoms, they need to understand what is normal function. What does your bladder do? And in 50% of the population that have a prostate, how does a prostate play into that? So the bladder, again, busy, busy slide here, but let me show you something. What the bladder does is it holds urine and it empties urine. Can I borrow this? It holds about this much. If you were to pee in this cup, and I wouldn't suggest doing that, but if you were to do that, you should fill this up. You should be able to fill it up and empty it. Well, your bladder should fill up and empty that amount comfortably. All right? If you fill up a small amount and like, oh, God, I got to go and you pee a, teaspo a you know, teaspoon or smaller than 300 mLs, that's OAB. 
that's overactive bladder. Your bladder is not living to its capacity. So when the bladder, the bladder is all about volume. You should be able to hold it and empty it. Your sphincter should be able to keep it tight so you don't dribble. That's normal. If those things don't happen, it's abnormal. The prostate, two functions. It creates fluid for seminal emission. And as you get older, it's supposed to stay out of the way. All right? It is, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's in a bad place. As we get older, the prostate grows. As it grows, it has two directions it can grow in. It can grow out, it can grow in. What happens if it grows in? It blocks, all right? It's a bad thing. After fertility years, it would be better if our prostate sat on our shoulder. It'd make the exam much easier. You don't have a rectal exam. Hey, your prostate feels good today, all right? But that's what needs to happen, but unfortunately it doesn't. So you need to understand the prostate is all about flow, right? So you've got the volume with the bladder and the flow with the prostate. And the symptoms go along with that. The symptoms of a bladder that doesn't hold enough is, ooh, we've got to go. It's urgency. It's small amounts. It's frequency, nocturia. The voiding with the bladder, or sorry, the, the voiding for the prostate is all about flow, right? Hesitancy, weak stream, intermittency, right? In Michigan, all the doctors were very, very advanced, by the way, in Michigan. We're much more advanced than you are in Florida. I don't know if you knew that. We're, we are much better. We all have urine flow meters to detect flow. Did you guys know that? Did everyone know that? No, we do. It's called snow. <laughs> and I'll ask the patients, can you write your name in the snow in script or braille? <laughs> right? So uh, when my son was in preschool, my, my wife called me up and she goes, I am so stinking mad at you. I'm like, what else? And it's like, what else is new? I'm like, what are you mad about? She goes, well, so, you know, Nathan was in preschool today. I said, yeah. She goes, yeah, he showed everyone how to write his name in the snow. <laughs> I cried a little bit. I tear my eye. I was so proud of him. It was like one of those daddy moments. It's like, ah, oh, he's, he's awesome. All right. So this is from a piece I wrote a couple years ago. It's very simple. And, and this is for everybody in the office. If, 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 if somebody, you know, you're answering the phone as an MA or the, you're taking an intake as the nurse or you're evaluating the patient and they tell you, you know, my flow isn't so good. You think the prostate, if I'm voiding small amounts, I think the bladder, if I'm leaking, it could be, it could be both. It could be the bladder or the sphincter. But if, if I have good flow, you know, I could, write my name, John Hancock Sr. If I can do that, what are the chances that I'm obstructive? It's not there, all right? And if I can void 500 mLs, that's good volume, good flow, and now I've got to think about a medical condition for why I'm voiding the way I am. And, and final thing on this is OAB and BPH can coexist. It's important. The prostate will grow as we get older. It doesn't have to grow into the uh, urethra, but if it does, it causes obstruction. So OAB itself, overactive bladder, is an irritative symptom, causes lower urinary tract symptoms. BPH, the prostate, will, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean there's pathology associated with it. And this is from an algorithm I wrote a couple years ago, just on a way to work it up. And that's how we're going to look at it now. Because when a patient comes into the office for that five-minute evaluation, I'm, it's like an onion, and I'm peeling the onion trying to figure things out. I'm looking at symptoms, and we, talk, we spoke about all these symptoms already. Frequency, nocturia, urgency. You know, the, what you have to ask yourself, are you having these symptoms and of small amounts? That's the key thing there. Frequently, if I'm going to the bathroom a lot, what are the amounts? I'm going to the bathroom at night, what is the amount? I'm rushing to the bathroom, what is the amount? That's how we define it, and it gives us an idea about where to go next. So I'll ask questions. Uh, you know, these are simple questions, but everyone's going to have their own. If you ask them a question such as, how are your voiding habits, and they've been voiding horribly for 10 years, but they didn't know they've gotten, they're living with it, well, that's a bad question. They're going to say, it's fine. You need to tell them, hey, do you have an urge before you have to go that you have to rush? Or do you have to wear a pad or a diaper? Can you sit through a movie? Do you leak? You know, you have to ask quality questions if we're trying to decipher what's going on. So then on the algorithm, we get to the evaluation. We get to the medical surgical history. We look at medications and exam, voiding diary and labs. This goes to an ARS question. The AUA recently said in the uncomplicated patient, you don't need all these fancy, fancy schmancy tests. 
We don't need urodynamic cystoscopy and diagnostic renal bladder ultrasounds. Now, why can medical issues cause these? And this is really important, again, for the staff as we're doing an intake and the staff being everybody, the person who answers the phone, the person who checks them in. How is your diabetes? All right? How is your diabetes? If it's not controlled, what do you have? have polyuria, polydipsia. If you have that, it could be worsening diabetes. Maybe it's uncovering OAB. It's not a symptom you need to live with. Congestive failure. You know, you had a recent heart attack, your heart is beating with a lower ejection fraction, you go to bed at night, you raise your legs, it, flush, it rushes to the heart, you're voiding all night. That's not OAB, all right? But these are things we need to know about. And recent surgeries. I have a lot of patients, you know, commonly post, like, orthopedic surgery, okay? Can't move. Sitting there watching whatever I watch as a soap opera, I get my first urge, my second urge, I'm waiting for my third urge, which, by the way, there isn't. And I'm trying to get to the bathroom. It's slow because I had my hip done. And then I wet myself because I waited too long. Okay? Or maybe there was irritation from the catheter. Or maybe they're constipated. Right? Remember, you know, we're in an opioid crisis. You know, despite the fact that we're in an opioid crisis, our, you go get hip surgery, your orthopedist gives you 20,000 Norcos. You want to be a good patient, so you take 20,000 Norcos, and before you know it, it's three weeks since you've had a bowel movement. All right? That's a problem with that. I had a patient not long ago, recent, recently had surgery, put on a lot of Norco, couldn't go to the bathroom, went to the emergency room, they did a bladder scan, they found 50 mLs, I'm sorry, 500 mLs of urine, they catheterized him, they got 50 out, they said they cured him, they sent him home with a leg bag. He comes in Monday morning, two days later, with a leg bag, miserable. This sucks. Miserable. Wait a minute. I guess they didn't do a rectal exam. Did a rectal exam. He had a brick in there. We pulled out the brick. We pulled out the foley. He wasn't happy with either of those. <laughs> he was happy at the end of it. And he thinks I'm like the best thing since sliced bread because he didn't have to have a catheter in him. All right? So we have to learn to ask why. All right? OAB, it goes along with that. Why? And again, that's a, that's a group effort when we do that. We look at the medications. I think the key thing is the, 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 the timing of the medication. I, I had a guy come in yesterday. He had a problem voiding. All right? Well, it's aller cold and allergy season in Michigan. He's taking an allergy med, a secondary, a secondary, a second generation antihistamine with a D on it. Well, the D squeezes the prostate. It makes it hard to void. So look at the timing of the medications for the problem. The physical exam, again, this is up to the providers, but, you know, you do an abdominal exam, make sure there's no masses, make sure they can walk to the bathroom. This is a key thing for all the staff. I've had staff members point out, say, you know what, we were watching Mr. Johnson walk in, and he's not walking right. All right? And I encourage my staff, if you see something happening, let me know. You know, Betty wasn't talking right today. She seems a little slow. She seems a little agitated. Do they know to get to the bathroom? Can they walk there? Make sure to do a genital urinary exam. If they have to pee through an opening, which is called a urethra, is the urethra open? All right? I had a guy come in recently with meatal stenosis, actually one of probably a dozen at this point over the years. I had a woman come in with a stricture at the urethra because she had a polyp that was causing scarring. So she couldn't void through that. All right, you have to look. Make sure for the female the vaginal mucosa is good, has good integrity. Make sure there's no prolapse. Rectal exam, you know, I can't say this enough. We really cannot give up on the rectal exam in primary care. There's this idea we don't need it. That's silliness. You know, it's, it's easy, it's quick, generally it's free. You know, make sure to check for tone, check for blood, things like that, prostate uh, tenderness and nodules. Lab tests, we don't need a lot. Back to the PCMH. Part of patient-centered medical home is not to waste money. You don't come in with this and get a, every test known to mankind, click, click, click. All right? The AUA says you need a urinalysis. That's all you need. They're a little bit wrong because you still have to screen for diabetes, but in a primary care setting, we've done that. That's because you have to be, have a, a high amount of uh, uh, sugar in your blood before you're spilling it in the urine. So we get a random or fasting blood sugar and PSA. I know, is everyone aware of the PSA controversy? Prostate cancer screening. 
I would love to come back and talk about that. I'd love to answer some questions on that. I'll give you my quick answer. Please screen. Ignore what the United States Preventive Task Force said that was ridiculous. They, 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 what they did is a crime as far as I'm concerned. If anyone hears from the task force, shame on you. But screen for that. And this, this isn't even screening. This is a patient coming in with symptoms. Check the PSA. If it's, and 1.5 is the magic number now. If it's above 1.5, it either means the prostate's bigger or you want to get that evaluated. That's when the risk of prostate cancer comes up. But that's all I'll say on that. Voiding diaries. I love voiding diaries. And this is something that everybody in the office should be aware of. All right. If you're going to have overactive bladder, it is a 24-hour, seven-day event. I am always going to the bathroom frequently. I am always getting up at night to void. It's happening all the time. It doesn't just happen when we're at work. It may be noticeable when we're at work, but it doesn't just happen. It doesn't happen when, we're, when we're, we're driving home. And I'll give you a little story. It's called my 5 o'clock coming to God story. Imagine this. You've had a really crummy day in the office. Horrible day. The worst day ever. Beyond the worst day ever. And you're grumbling as you walk out of the office, and there's the Starbucks glistening in the distance. And you walk up to the Starbucks and said, I'm going to treat myself for my unbelievably crummy day, and I'm going to have a triple latte. I get my triple latte. I'm getting in my car. I'm pretty happy now, actually. Really kind of happy. I get into my car. I turn on 20, station 24 on Sirius because that's Margaritaville, right? right? Everyone likes Jimmy Buffett here, right? I did hear once that in, in, uh, in Florida there's two things. There's Jimmy Buffett and God, and you're not sure which is which. Anyhow, so you get in your car with your triple latte, right? And you get on the freeway when you're driving home. Bam, there's a traffic accident. Car stops. But it's okay, you have your triple latte. Kind of happy. Until you're not happy. And your bladder starts contracting. Oh, God. And you're holding it. You kind of start holding your crotch because you know you got to pee. You're bouncing a little bit. You're still drinking your triple latte because it was $6.95. You turn on the air conditioner, right? <laughs> and you start tapping your foot like this. And you're holding and you're freezing. And you jump off the off-ramp and you see your house and your bladder's going through this Pavlovian response. And you're like, oh my God, this is where you're praying to God. I don't want to pee my pants. I don't want to pee my pants. You run in the house. You throw your briefcase at the dog. You pull your pants down halfway. Your kids are like, oh God. You dive on the toilet. You thank God you didn't wet yourself. <laughs> right? There is no medication for that. <laughs> All right? This is why we use bladder diaries. And I've had a, not, a lot of patients come in. I'm like, your problem's only from five to eight. What are you doing? And then they're like, tell you the triple latte. It doesn't mean they stop the triple latte. It just means now they know. So I use voiding diaries because it tells us how much we take, how we void, and how we can work on that. Post-void residuals, just a quick thought on that. We use post-void residuals because there's this idea that men go into retention if you use anti-muscarinics or beta-3s or whatever to slow the bladder down. I will tell you this urban myth. If you can write your name in the snow and it's, you write it well, you're not obstructed. You're not going to go into obstruction on a medication. It ain't going to happen. I did a meta-analysis that I published in 2008 looking at that, and we realized that any male with a good flow is fine. Any male who has a post-void residual of less than 50 before we start is fine. So if you're worried that the, the, the flow is weak, if you're, maybe it could be BPH, then you can check, and if it's above 50, refer them, but that's not most of the cases. And then you just use common sense. If you can't void or haven't voided for several hours after what I did for my therapy, you just call us. You know, so that's the common sense part. This is the, for the providers, this is the most important thing I can show you today which is how to be safe. You know, there's a simple way to evaluate this. There's safety, safety first. Good, good evaluation, good treatment, safety. If you see any of these things now, you refer to a specialist. Recurrent infections, radiation, blood, prior surgery, you can read the rest, then you refer. But otherwise, other than that, we can treat it in the primary care office because we haven't found identifiable etiology. There are no reversible causes. We go back to that algorithm, you know, that we talked about. So if, if you want treatment... Great. 
go to the algorithm. If you don't want treatment, hey, just be aware that there could be a problem. If you do want it, I focus. If it's flow, I focus on the prostate. If it's voiding volumes, I focus on the bladder. If it's incontinence, then I think leakage, and that may get a referral. So this is the back to the algorithm, and the only reason I put that up, if there's any concern that it's the prostate, treat the prostate first. Use a PD-5 or a uh, alpha block, and we, we're not going to talk more about the prostate here. So how do we treat this? The cornerstone of treatment's behavioral therapy, understanding what the heck is going on with your bladder and what to expect, pharmacologic management, and then referral. Who knows what behavioral therapy is? Bladder hygiene, right? Understanding what your bladder does. Understanding how it works. Understanding your bladder is your friend. That's what behavioral therapy is. We talk about things like habit changes, how you drink, you know, how you go to the bathroom. What do we mean by that? So here's a question for you. Who is more dysfunctional avoiding, men or women? Who says men? Who says women? Who says they're scared because I'm about to tell you? All right. All right. I will tell you this. At the risk of being tremendously sexist, women are markedly more dysfunctional avoiding than men. Okay? For this, two reasons. One, you will not sit on a toilet that you did not buy. Okay, because we all know that's how you're going to get pregnant or an STD, and you're going to have to explain that one, right? I swear to God, it was the restroom toilet. Uh, sorry, it doesn't work that way. Come up with a better excuse. The other thing you will do is you go to the group, you go to the bathroom in groups. All right, men don't. Women, they're going to go. Hey, let's go powder our nose, and I tell my wife, and they all go to powder their nose. We, that's how you, I'm sorry, I'm bad. But men don't do that, right? Watch. Steve, you want, or Brian, sorry, I said Steve. Do you want to go pee with me? Yeah, see? <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work. It, it really doesn't work that way. So as a result, what happens when you try to pee, right? You're, you're in the stall or in the john with your 10 favorite friends, right? And you're bent over because you're not going to sit because you know who just sat on the toilet, and your knees are together, and your pants and your underpants are here, because God forbid your friends see your stuff. <laughs> and you're trying to pee, all right? Can you possibly empty your bladder like this? Of course not. Of course not. You actually have to sit on the toilet. Take your pants and your underpants down. <laughs> Open your legs. This is why we have a door so people don't see your junk. <laughs> right? <laughs> And you sit on the toilet, you relax, you count to 10, you void again. You know, voiding should be a comfortable thing. I mean, I remember, I remember studying for the boards. It was the only thing I did in my life that was fun. You know, and for men, it's the same thing. You know, you're, if, you, if you can't relax the pelvic musculature, relax, sit on the toilet. No one cares, all right? Or stand at the toilet, count to 10 and void again. I've got a homework assignment for everybody tonight. Because I am an intensely smart guy. Yeah, you know, I'm from Michigan. Intensely smart guy. I know that everybody's going to pee at some point today. <laughs> Bam! Blew your minds. Yeah, I did. I do know that everyone's going to pee. So when you void today, I want you to sit there and count to 10 or stand there and count to 10 and see if you get a little more out. And then when you're talking to a patient as a provider, as a anybody in the office, and they talk about these things, say, you know what? Let, let me, how, how are you doing this? Let me, let me give you a little hint. Let me give you a little hint. I, I just had a guy Thursday come in, for example. I shared this little thing. He goes, you know what? I totally didn't believe you. I totally thought you were full of it. And I tried that, and son of a gun, you were right. It works. You know, as healthcare providers, we are notoriously dysfunctional voiders. We are. You know, because it's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to squeeze another patient in. I really got to go, but I'm going to squeeze another patient in. And I'm going to run to the bathroom, and I'm going to empty my bladder enough to be comfortable, but not enough to empty. And then half an hour later, I go back to the bathroom, and the nurses are, didn't you just go to the bathroom? I'm like, yes, I did. Yes, I did, but you were yelling at me then, and I, I'm, you know. So, learn to be functional, all right? This is all in your books, I believe, or the handouts. This is how to do pelvic floor exercise. Everyone heard of Kegels? Really good, really cheap, really easy. You can do them any time. I've done 15,346 since I stepped up. Molly, you did how many? You've done five. You've done five. You failed me. You promised if I made you laugh, you would do kegels. Now you're going to have to catch up. 
All right, so whatever you do, now I personally like drug therapy because that's when patients come to me, they want something. I will try behavioral therapy. It works about 50% of the time alone. But if I'm going to use drug therapy, I'm going to make sure they're continuing on the behavioral therapy. This is how we look at it. Eight antimuscarinics, six are oral, two are topical, one beta, three adrenergic agonists. All the meds are effective. All the meds work. There is not one drug that's better than another. I don't care who tells you what. So you have to find, this is, this is the individualized way that we do care. What works best for that patient? And that's what we need to understand. And I'll try a lot of meds before I'll, I'll wave the white flag and refer them off. This is how we look at it for those of you who prescribe drugs. We have two classes. If you block the muscarinic receptor, you block contraction. If you stimulate the beta-3 receptor, you stimulate relaxation. At the end of the day, the thing that happens for both is you get more urine in the bladder. That's what we want. We're trying to hold more. Remember, bladder is all about volume. These are the antimuscarinics. Those of us who are old like me understand the immediate release drugs. They were really good but not very tolerable. You have titratable doses in some cases but multiple times a day. We were very happy when the extended release drugs came out. All of these, for the most part, are, are, most of them are generic. They're titratable, once-a-day dosing. They're all very good. Common side effects as a class, antimuscarinics cause dry mouth. That is the big one. We're talking about 9%, 10%. This is why people stop it. That's 9% in the studies. I guarantee you it's even more in, the, in clinical work. All right? They'll stop it because they talk like this. They can't, and they can't stop it. They hate it. Constipation, headaches, blurred, blurred vision. If they can tolerate it, fantastic. But if they can't, we either trade drugs in the class or jump classes. So it's really a balance of efficacy and tolerability. And that's what I'll tell the patients. Look, let's find something that works for you. Because I don't care what drug you're using. It may, one drug may work in one person and the other drug's not gonna, or the next person is not going to work. I don't know why. It just ends up that way. In regards to warnings and precautions, you don't want to use it if you can't empty your bladder. That's kind of a no-brainer. You don't want to use it if you have uncontrolled narrow-angle glaucoma. I am not smart enough to tell you what that is. I can tell you what glaucoma is. I can tell you that I will refer them to an ophthalmologist. I can tell you that if you make a mistake and they have the wrong glaucoma and you've used the drug and their vision gets worse, you stop the drug, they'll be fine. All right? So it's not a like, oh, my God, I've just ruined this life. You're not, it's not going to happen. Warnings and precautions, angioedema, clinically significant bladder outlet obstruction, decreased GA motility, the glaucoma we spoke about. Look at the bottom for the myasthenia gravis. The key effect we worry about with antimuscarinics, and this is really important for everybody to know, is the CNS effects. All right? There are five muscarinic receptors. M2 and M3 are on the bladder. M2 facilitates M3. M3 causes the contraction. That's what we're aiming at. But when you use an antimuscarinic, it goes to all the receptors. M1 is on the brain. The older we are, the leakier the blood-brain barrier is. The leakier the blood-brain barrier, the more likely that medication is going to get across. If you use an antimuscarinic in a patient who is has a leaky blood-brain barrier or susceptible, you can cause cognitive issues. What does that mean? It means your 80-year-old grandmother is acting like she's 90. The, bless you. And they unfortunately won't know it. Okay? The antimuscarinics are significant enough for cognitive issues that it's on the beers list. You guys are familiar with the beers list? All right? That's do not use this in the elderly population. Unfortunately, a lot of our insurance companies ignore that and say you have to use that first. But I will tell you, I will not use an antimuscarinic on a cognitively impaired patient. It is the wrong thing to do. Okay? But we have options. That's the good thing. We have options for them. So just be aware of that. So when I talk to you about efficacy of the antimuscarinics, this is a scatter plot. The worse your urinary urge incontinence, the better you seem to do on it. This is a class effect. Not one drug stands out. The same when you look at efficacy for urgency reduction. Again, you're seeing the worse your urgency right here on the bottom, right there on the bottom, the worse it is, the better the drugs do. It's a class thing. I can't tell you why one drug works better in another than one person, in one person and not in the other. What this shows us is we have options and we can play. And I will play with, in, a, in an appropriate patient, I will play with several antimuscarinics before I'll call it a day. Beta-3 adrenergic agonists, there's only one out there, Mirabigron, a brand name Mirabetric. There's a two doses like the, um, 
the antimuscarinics is titratable. This is a study showing it works the same way the antimuscarinics. Number of incontinent episodes get better the worse you are. All right, you can have a higher percentage or a, 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 a higher uh, total increase. So it's going to improve. The worse you are, the better it's going to be for incontinence, for urgency, for micturition, same thing. The better it's going to be, the worse you are. Okay, of course, that makes sense. But this is the, this is the one I like the most. The voided volume, because anytime you look at a study on overactive bladder, you want to look at voided volume, because you can't make that stuff up. If I'm giving you a drug to stop contraction or facilitate relaxation, you should hold more. And when you look at this, you're holding 20 on median. Remember, this is mean, all right? 25 mLs. You know, that's not bad. You think, maybe sitting there going, hey, that's not a lot. But remember, a 70 kilogram male or female makes a half a cc to a cc an hour in a regular state. All right, so 25 mLs, you may get 40 minutes out of that. You may get 50 minutes out of that. You may get a half an hour out of that, and that's enough to avoid the stinky rest stop and get to where you're going. And that's what these patients want. We can't make you stop peeing, but we can give you that little bit extra time. If you're voiding 12 times a day, now you're voiding 10 times a day. All right, and that makes all the difference in the world. This is a long-term study with Mir Bigron, and this is, again, for the efficacy argument I made. This is against tolteridine, a commonly used antimuscarinic, and over a 12-month period, what you see is they work. That's what you want to know. They work. All right, common side effects, hypertension, that kind of flips the urologist out because they have to buy a blood pressure cuff. They don't like that. You guys know the definition of a double-blind study? Two urologists reading an EKG. They don't, they don't like medical stuff. So nasopharyngitis, UTIs, headaches. All right, again, it's a balance of efficacy and tolerability. There are no contraindications. The precautions and warnings, if it's hypertension, just be aware for primary care. We don't really, that's not a big issue for us. Uh, if you have bladder outlet obstruction, you don't want to use it. Um, we're going to, they talk in the package labeling about, eh, don't be careful with an antimuscarinic, but I'm going to show you some studies that show the safety there. And if you're using a CYP2D6 narrow index drugs like uh, flecainide or uh, uh, propamphenone, then you probably don't want to use it, but those are pretty uncommon medications. This is some of the research that's come out in the last couple of years that I have absolutely loved. It's talking about combination therapy. Now, how many are aware of combination therapy in the world of hypertension? Okay. You remember years ago, I'll, I'll point to you because we look about the same age. Remember we, we, we fought that one? 20, oh, my God, they came in, and we would max out our ACE, and we'd max out our diuretic, and they'd say combo, and the drug rep would come in, and we're like, no, no, don't. You know, we, we just wanted to disagree with them because we're doctors, and we get to disagree. But the, the reality is we weren't comfortable. And then we got comfortable. And we realized that when we use a combination of drugs, we can use them at lower doses. And when you use them at lower doses, what do we get? Lower side effects. Again. So in the world of OAB, I remember when I first saw this, I was talking to the urologist because I was sitting on a, uh, on a research council, and they couldn't understand it. I'm like, oh, my God, this is great. This is great. We've been doing this for a long time. And it really, uh, that's the question is, can we get at least equal efficacy and decrease our side effect profile. So let's look at that. There was the BESIDE trial, which looked at monotherapy of solifenacin versus combination. And what did you see? You saw at least equal efficacy, combination here for zero incontinent episodes. Combination was actually better than monotherapy. In the one for the greater than 50% decrease, it was at least equivalent to 10. It was better than 5. So efficacy is at least as good. We can take that. Patients achieving an average of less than eight micturitions, it's at least as good as 10. It's better than five. Awesome. What about symptom score? Hey, all of a sudden, combination's working better. All right? Their symptoms are better. They like this better. When you look at the health-related quality of life scores, look at this. Combination is markedly better. My life is better by using this. And how do we judge life is better? Because we're probably tolerating the drug better. We know the drugs work. Can we tolerate them? Because I don't care how much it works. If we have bad side effects, we don't want to do it. So when we break down the quality of life, when we look at coping and concern and sleep and social, again, combination is better. But that's a no-brainer for us. 
This is the key thing. Look at the side effects. The most, the worst side effects with the antimuscarinics are, is the dry mouth. And you look at this, it's 9.5 for the most efficacious dosing of solifenacin. The low, the combo is the same as the low dose. So patients like this better. They like this better. It works better for them. They're more comfortable. When you look at, I wanted to put this for the special interest one, because in the package insert it said, be aware of using an antimuscarinic with a beta-3 in combination. You worry about retention. Well, no one went into acute retention on the combo studies. And some patients had retention over time, and that's defined as filling their bladder up a little more, but nothing that caused a problem. So again, markedly better results, at least equal efficacy, certainly with better tolerability. And one more study in combination, the Synergy trial. You can see this now breaks down Sully 5 plus Mirabig around 25 and 50 versus monotherapy, looking at patient outcomes and efficacy, such as, or efficacy as well as safety. And what do we see? Combination therapy, mean number of UI, epi- UI episodes, combo worked better. Of course it did. You're hitting two receptors as opposed to one. When you look at number of micturitions, again, combo worked better. All right, this is a way to go. But what about side effects? What about quality of life? When they asked patients about it, the quality of life score, I know this is a very busy slide, the quality of life was better with the combination than it was with monotherapy. Easy, easy explanation. Efficacy plus better tolerability. That's the way to look at it. So the nice thing for us is we have options for patients, options that we haven't necessarily explored before. So what are those if these don't work? All right. So we've tried monotherapy. We've uh, we've tried behavioral therapy. We've tried monotherapy. We've tried combination therapy. This is where we utilize our specialist. These are your options. So we still have, we have percutaneous tibial nerve modulation. We have inner stem, which is sacral nerve modulation. And we have Botox. So we still have options. Now let's change gears and talk about the team approach. How are we going to work on this as a group? Okay. And why do we need to work on this as a group? This comes from a study, I actually presented this in uh, Sweden a couple years ago. It was really fascinating because I was asked the question of why do people not stay on these meds, All right? And I looked at some of the data, and I found the Gopal study, and at 36 months, what this says is 8% of the patients are still on the meds. 92% drop. So why would somebody drop from the meds? Well, the medication's not working, Okay. They don't understand it. We've not addressed the expectations. They have side effects. We have the wrong pathology. It's expensive. It's a nuisance. Or we didn't use the right dosing, and that would be ineffective. All right, so what do we do on that? And this is part of what we have to explain. This is why patient-centered medical homes are so valuable. And I'll go back to this slide for a second. When I saw this, I went to my staff. I'm like, God, when we look at our own data, we have a markedly better compliance here. Markedly better compliance. But that's because we educate, because there's nobody better at educating than primary care. All right, the specialists say, here's your medication, call me if you need me. So how do we do this? We address expectations, urgency, incontinence, nighttime void, and quality of life. We have to do that. And this comes around, I've already spoken about this, this takes the village. This is the office working in sync with the patient and with the specialist. That We need to tell the patient what is normal and what to expect. I start talking about urinary habits when they're young. So that if it's abnormal, they'll bring it up to me. The specialist needs to provide my backup. They need to help me. They need to tell me what I can do and when I need to do it. And for me as a primary care doctor, there's no reason I can't diagnose this in my office reasonably, quickly, efficiently, and and not expensive. That's how we have to do it. So that's the village concept. Now, in my office, I find it successful to see them back in two to four weeks because I'll tell them we may titrate up. In fact, 50% of the time we do. I'll have my staff follow them, and they'll say, you know, Dr. Rosenberg will talk to you, or, you know, if you need to, we might want to up the dose. We might want to change the medication. So my office is tuned in. They know what they're doing because I'm explaining to to them. We're going over the side effects. We're, We're really taking care of as many expectations as we can. And how do we do this? I mean, this is the whole concept of patient-centered medical home. It starts with listening and screening. It starts with a good history, set up treatment goals, be a cheerleader, 
Do you guys know the, um, the method, the talk back method or the state back method? Where you tell a pay, and I do this, I, when we became a PCMH, I read this somewhere and I started using it. I use it all the time. I am giving you this drug for your bladder. Can you, why am I giving you this drug? What are we expecting? All right. Boom. I do it for everything. And it really does help. It really does help. And it saves me those phone calls of like, why did you want me to do this again? So it really does help. And why should you as a PCMH be concerned? I mean, this is huge. If the patient's unhappy, we're going to be unhappy. If they're unhappy, they're going to give us naughty satisfaction scores. If we get those, right, what happens? Not only increased cost because it's more expensive for them, but we're, our reimbursement goes down. As a PCMH, my reimbursement is tied into satisfaction, so I better make sure they're happy. So let me wind this up with this. Uh, overactive bladder doesn't take your life. It does steal it unless you fall, and then it will take your life. It, it's a nuisance disease, again, until you fall. It can be adequately diagnosed and treated in a primary care setting where most of these patients are, and they're undiagnosed, and we have to make a goal of the PCMH to take care of the whole patient, and the bladder is part of this. And the final things for PCMH, for every member of the staff, identify, talk about behavioral modification because it's so hugely important, offer appropriate treatment, and encourage compliance. Well, guys, first of all, thank you very much. I hope you learned something today, and I'll answer some questions if you want. I, that was an excellent presentation. I had a quick question about... Um, can, you, can I give you my mom's phone number and you can tell her? <laughs> um, atrophic vaginitis. Yes. I, I know it's a cause of frequent yes. urinary tract infections. I wasn't aware it's a cause of bladder incontinence. Can you address it? Irritation is the cause. So atrophic, everyone hear that question, atrophic vaginitis and the relation? We like to say atrophic vaginitis is a cause of UTIs. Atrophic vaginitis is a cause of urinary tract symptoms. It's a UTI only when proven by culture. If it's culture, absolutely, okay? If it's not culture, then it's probably OAB. Either way, the treatment of atrophic vaginitis is still going to be topical estrogen in limited doses. With the WHI, Women's Health Initiative, we want to be careful, but you can use it for the vaginal atrophy. So you have an 80-year-old who has those symptoms. Do you do a pelvic exam on them? Yes. We're giving them a little bit of estriol or estradiol? Absolutely. You still do a pelvic exam. Okay, thanks. Because you don't know what's there. Okay. All right? If you're assuming because... You know, for whatever reason, there's not an STD, there's no discharge, there's no tumor, you don't have to do it. But if, as long as you still have genitals, they need to be looked at. What if you can't even pass a speculum or so? Well, that, you don't have to do a speculum exam, though. Okay. So I mean, just basically, an when you're doing an introitus exam, you're trying to look as far as you can. Remember, really deep, there's not a lot there that you're looking at. You might want to do a digital exam to feel, but you're really looking at the urethra, if it's movable, if there's a cyst, a cystocele, a diverticulum, things like that. Thank you. You bet. Our office is a pediatric office, okay. and so we deal with a lot of enuresis, nocturnal enuresis, and a little bit of um, encopresis. Mm -hmm. So with those kids, some of them may be on some for ADHD and some of those drugs. How would you handle those Great. children? The, the question there was on, uh, was on enuresis and econopresis, so the, for stool. Um, I do see a lot of that. It is different than OAB. Remember, the, what happens when we're born, okay, we have a reflex, so when mom has changed, your dad is changing your diaper, they take the diaper off, the reflex kicks in, you pee in somebody's eye. That's what happens. As we get older, our midbrain kicks in, and our reflex is still going, but the midbrain says, you know what, it's a bad time to pee. Okay? So the first urge is ignored, and the second urge happens. Okay? Then you go to the bathroom. When we have enuresis, that pathway is not working. Okay? So what we have to do is teach the pathway. And there are really no good medications for that. Um, enuresis is quite common, a lot more common than people talk about. We say something like at age 6 or 7, 15% of kids will still have that, and it will reduce 15% or remain 15% every year thereafter. So in 12 or 13, it's going to kick in for the most part. Um, the way to treat it is behavioral, okay? So if you go to bed at 8 and you wake up at 6, okay, um, the question is when are you having the accident? So you have them empty their bladder, not by 
jumping into the bathroom and hurrying back quickly, sitting on the toilet, relaxing, getting everything out. You also have them stop drinking fluids about an hour or two before. Then what you do is you wake them up at night, okay? So if they, they go to, let's say they go to bed at 8 and they wake up at 6. I'm going to wake them up at midnight, and you're going to void. And if they have an accident, I want to know if it's between 8 to 12 or 12 to 6, because when I find that, I'm going to put another one in there. Okay, And then once I find that they're not having voiding accidents anymore because of my intervals, I stretch the intervals out. So really what you're doing is you're teaching the brain to kick in. Uh, when you're talking about the stool issues, a lot of times we have to worry about things like impaction. Um, you know, um, We have to worry about, uh, you could have sphincter tightening. I've seen that quite a bit, uh, just in pure embarrassment. So we start working on the behavioral things as well. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the meeting.